Um, let's switch gears now and look to Crohn's disease and Peter Hen Hendricks, who is a gastroenterologist at the University Hospital in Ghent and visiting us here at the AMC as a as a Robarts uh, research physician, basically a research gastroenterologist, Peter will um, discuss with us success factors for the treatment of uncomplicated Crohn's disease. Please, Peter. Thank you, good evening. I would like to start with two cases. The first patient is a 45-year-old female patient that received a diagnosis of ileal Crohn's disease long time ago, for which she received bedesonide, and then two years later, she had an another flare of ileal Crohn's disease for which we, she received budesonide again, and she was started on as a tyroprin maintenance therapy. Then, after four years, she developed another flare of ileal Crohn's disease, again treated with budesonide. At that time, she had a poor adherence to her as a tyroprin maintenance therapy. Ten years later, she presented again at the outpatient clinic with abdominal cramps and watery diarrhea. At that time, she didn't have any maintenance treatment, and she tells us that she had two episodes of similar complaints over the last five years. The other patient was a patient that was diagnosed with ileal Crohn's disease in 2012 with an intra-abdominal abscess at that time, for which she immediately received ileocecal resection. In 2013, she received her post-operative ile ileocolonoscopy, and uh, this was very reassuring and no maintenance treatment was started. But then unfortunately in 2014 she presented again with abdominal cramps and watery diarrhea. And so my question is, the ileocolonoscopy shows similar lesions in both patients, but would you treat both patients in the same way? So if you say yes, please show your white card. If you say yeah, if you say no, please show your red card. Red card. Red is yeah. no, yes is the same treatment for, for the two patients. Okay, I see some white, most so of let's them say it's two are thirds. showing. I think it's two thirds red, yeah. even perhaps three quarters. So this is uh, my presentation outline. So I would like to start with what is uncomplicated So you're not gonna tell us the right answer? I will tell it in a, right. in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> what is uncomplicated Crohn's disease? How frequent is it? How can we identify patients that are at risk for a complicated disease course? And what are the success factors in the treatment of un uncomplica uncomplicated Crohn's disease? If you look at the literature, there is quite a consensus about the definition of complicated Crohn's disease, uh, wi which is basically, basically Crohn's disease without any bowel damage, like strictures or abscesses or fistulas, and without the need for surgery. If you look at the Montreal classification, so we mean here the B1 behavior phenotype, which is the inflammatory behavior phenotype without stricture formation and without the penetration, uh, penetrating complications. Is it frequent? Yes, it is. A diagnosis, this uh, counts for 75% of the patients. But we all know that Crohn's disease is a progressive disease and that some of these patients will develop complications over time. And this has all also been nicely demonstrated in large inception uh, cohort studies, like here in this Ibsen cohort. So most of the patients at diagnosis had an inflammatory disease behavior. But after five years, you see that many of those, those patients had progressed towards complications. So how to tailor the therapeutic strategy in Crohn's disease? On the one side, we want we don't want to undertreat the patients, we don't want to have those complications. But on the other hand, we don't want to overtreat the patients, we don't want to harm the patients, and we don't want to prescribe expensive drugs, of course, to the patients who, uh, that, don't, uh, that doesn't need, don't need the treatment. How can we identify patients at risk for a complicated disease course? Does age at diagnosis matter? Yes, it does. So I show you here the results of pediatric onset Crohn's disease and elderly onset Crohn's disease, patients that were diagnosed at an age above 60. And you see that the, in the elderly onset Crohn's disease patients, the disease behavior remains remarkably stable over time, which is not the, the case in the pediatric onset Crohn's disease. Disease location does matter. 
as compared to colonic location, patients with a terminal ileal involvement or patients with upper GI uh, involvement, they have more frequently a complicated disease course with an uh, odds ratio of 9 to 12. This has been confirmed several times. So this is from um, a study from, from Jacques Kuhn. Uh, showing that, uh, again, showing that ileal location is associated with a complica uh, complicated disease behavior as compared to a colonic location only. And also here in this Portuguese study, it is clearly shown that uh, patients with ileal involvement, they have an increased probability of getting a surgical intervention over time. Smoking, so we all know the risk of smoking, and we all know that it's a risk factor for Crohn's disease. And all the evidence was summarized in this meta analysis, which was published in fact this month in APT. And it showed that smoking was indeed in, uh, associated with an increased risk of flares, with an increased risk of surgery, first surgery, increased risk of relapse after surgery, and an increased risk for a second surgery. This was a study from Mathieu Allais, which clearly showed that patients that had deep colonic ulcers at presentation had an increased risk of colectomy over time. I'm showing here such a picture of deep colonic ulcers. Also, those patients with deep ulcers at diagnosis, they had an increased risk of penetrating uh, complications. This is a very nice study, it's a re retrospective study, unfortunately, but it identified um, predictive factors for a mild course of Crohn's disease. And mild course of Crohn's disease was defined as not needing surgery, not having complications, not needing immunosuppressive drugs. And they developed a kind of scoring system, and so if the score was below or equal to one, less than 20% of the patients had a complicated disease course. So I think those kinds of studies are very important and we need prospective studies to identify really the patients uh, that do not need aggressive treatments. What are the success factors now in the treatment of uncomplicated Crohn's disease? First of all, you have to use the right drugs and at the right dose, of course. And here are the echo recommendations for first-line induction treatment in Crohn's disease. So for mildly active ileocecal Crohn's disease, ECHO is clearly recommending budesonide. For moderately active ileocecal Crohn's disease, budesonide is a valuable option, and conventional corticosteroids may be an alternative. For severely active ileocecal Crohn's disease, ECHO is recommending conventional steroids, and for colonic uh, Crohn's disease, ECHO recommends conventional corticosteroids, and in some patients with mild disease, 5 ASA may have a, uh, may have a place. So what, what are the data behind this? I'll show you here the main early trials, in fact, with budesonide for active ileocecal Crohn's disease. The first one was from Paul Rutgeerts, and there were some methodological issues with the study, but, but it showed that uh, there were no big differences between bedizonide and conventional steroids uh, in terms of induction of clinical remission. The second one was comparing placebo with bedizonide 9 mg a day and clearly showed that bedizonide was superior to placebo for active ileocecal Crohn's disease. And the third one was a superiority trial showing that uh, bedizonide was superior to mesalamine uh, for the treatment of active ileocecal Crohn's disease after 16 weeks of treatment. So again, all the data were combined in this meta-analysis, which uh, is a recent meta-analysis from 2015. And if we look at the data for induction of clinical uh, remission in active ileocecal Crohn's disease, uh, there is clearly a benefit of budesonide over mesalamine. If you look at the difference between conventional steroids and bedizonides, overall, you won't find any difference. There might be a difference. Th these are 
This is a sub-analysis, so there might be a difference for patients with severe ileal cecal Crohn's disease at, um, and, um, in which conventional stereo steroids tend to do better than bedesonide. And this is the reason why ECHO recommends conventional steroids in this uh, category of Crohn's disease patients. And if you look at the corticosteroid-related adverse events, there is clearly a benefit of bedesonide over conventional steroids. This study from Axel Dignes, which, which was published in the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis in 2014, demonstrated that uh, once daily do dosing of bedesonide, 9 milligrams, was equally uh, effective as three times daily dosing uh, without any uh, difference in, in the safety uh, signals. It has to be stated again that bedesonide is not to be used as a maintenance treatment in Crohn's disease. This was also the conclusion in a recent meta-analysis. Uh, the data suggest that bedesonide is not effective for maintenance of remission in Crohn's disease, particularly when used beyond three months following induction of remission. What about repeated courses of bedesonide? Are they acceptable? Are they acceptable for some patients with mild ileocecal Crohn's disease? Probably yes. So I show you here the safety data from a 12-month trial in collagenous colitis. So all patients had an in induction regimen with 9 milligrams a day. And then uh, they had a 12-month um, uh, period with 4.5 milligrams of bedesonide a day. And there were no major safety concerns. There were slightly uh, more um, cutaneous symptoms, but no uh, severe adverse events. So I think it's important that when we have a patient before us, that we uh, make our therapeutic strategy according to the risk stratification. And so I've uh, told you about all the different uh, risk factors. So patients with a low probability of complications are patients with mild disease that are non-smoking, that are older, and uh, for which we know that already that they have a long-term inflammatory disease behavior, like for the first patients. So we had already a lot of information, uh, long-term information, and patients with pure colonic uh, uh, disease. So these patients you can probably uh, treat uh, on, an, on a symptom-based uh, manner. And so this I would propose for the first patient that, that uh, I discussed earlier. Patients with a high probability of complications are patients with severe disease, deep colonic ulcers or extensive small bowel disease, patients that are smoking, early onset of disease, previous surgery like the second patient had, patients with ileal disease, patients with perianal lesions, those are the patients at risk for a complicated disease course. So for the, sec the second patient that I discussed, presented with a major complication, so I think in this patient you should go for a maintenance treatment to prevent further complications. Empowerment of, of the patient, I think that's really the key to, to success. Cope, you have to communicate with the patient. I think it's very important that we tell them why we are prescribing the, the drug, what we are expecting from the drug, but that we also explore the patient's ideas and expectations and the concerns. This is a very interesting study published in Gastroenterology in 2007, showing that for the patients, the main determinant of satisfaction was in fact a reduction of the daily symptom, uh, severity of the symptoms that they have. While the long-term effect for complications and the time to a next flare was clearly less significant for the patients. They were willing to pay a certain risk, but the risk could not be too high. So Elsa al already elucidated the importance of, uh, of non-adherence. So I think it's important that we identify the patient with a, a high likelihood of being non-adherent to therapy and th that we identify the drivers of the, this non-adherence. And there are a lot of strategies to improve adherence in IBD patients. So improve the knowledge, just tell them what you are doing, why you are doing it, 
uh, try to simplify medication regimens, identify the barriers, identify the concerns of the patients, identify their expectations, what is important for this particular patient, why, it is, uh, why is it important, and I know we are all very busy per, uh, people, but I think here there is a very important role for the IBD nurse. Then the effects, the, the last thing I would like to say is that there is a clear effect of smoking cessation on the disease course in Crohn's disease. If patients stop smoking, the probabi probability of a flare-up of their disease is, uh, goes down and the need for immunosuppressives go down. But there is still a lot of work to do. This is an, an analysis that was performed in Leuven and was published in 2015. And that clearly demonstrated that most of the patients with Crohn's disease were not aware of the effect of, of the impact of smoking on their disease. So I think we can do better. So I would like to end with this take home messages. I think it's important that we use the right drugs in the right, right way at the right time. We should treat according to risk stratification. We have to prevent damage, but we have to minimize harm as well. And then importantly, please empower your patients and identify these concerns and expectations. I thank you for your attention.